Hello and welcome. You're watching Countdown on Bloomberg Quint Live, India's first digital live streaming business news service. These are the top headlines that we're tracking at this hour. Markets are in correction mode on expiry day. The Nifty trades below the 10,300 mark. Reliance Communications reaches out to its Indian lenders in a bid to stop the China Development Bank from filing an insolvency plea, but to no avail. That's, Bloom that's a Bloomberg Quint exclusive. Oil prices are in focus as investors closely watch for OPEC's next move on supply cuts in Vienna. And India's GDP is expected to record an uptick for the first time in six quarters when the July to September numbers come out later today. Well, this is an exciting expiry day. That way, if you are bored of uh, lack of volatility over the last three sessions, but the kind of cuts that we have seen are definitely were not anticipated. Uh, although there is an all-important opaque meet happening today, there is no such strong negative trigger really for a deep correction. The, uh, <coughs> the one that we have seen today, market is currently down by around three quarters of a percent if you look at Nifty or uh, Sensex, if you look at Bank Nifty. Uh, Bank Nifty or banking stocks have in fact led this correction and we'll, uh, we'll see, see that uh, when we look at the contributors. Well, if you look at mid cap and small cap or the, or the broader end of the market, the numbers might be deceiving. I mean, a mid cap index trading down by 65 points, that is fine. But you look at the market breadth in index stocks and in the beginning uh, of the day, this morning we had 80% stocks in red scenario hasn't really changed maybe two or three stocks here and there so index stocks are definitely in uh, in focus and they are down as we talked about it you know the banking stocks like excess bank this is second or third uh, down session for excess bank sbi has lost two percent because they have hiked the uh, bulk deposit rates although management believes that they see a profit uh, opportunity a money making opportunity here because bond yields are much higher so even if they are paying more for bulk deposits they're not going to lose money incrementally this is going to contribute to the bottom line market is not convinced yet SBI is down 1% Kotak, uh, Kotak Mahindra Bank and then look at the heavyweight reliance which is also down uh, almost 2% uh, so there is pressure on index heavyweights there is pressure on bulk of the FNO stocks but if you look at the broader end of the spectrum the scenario might be different but before that let's see how, how does the market breadth really look like Again, if you just look at the numbers, there are more losers than gainers at this point of time. It's trying to converge, but uh, most part of the day we have seen that, uh, uh, you know, in best case scenario, you had, you had three losers for two gainers. In worst case, you had two losers for each gainer. So that has been the equation. But if you look at the kind of volume which is there on these stocks which are moving up, like the T stocks or some more mid cap stocks that Navneet is going to talk about, and you compare that with the stocks which are down, in the broader market, outside the FNO space, there is no panic. There is no selling, a broad-based selling pressure. There is no liquidation uh, happening in this market. So maybe indice indices or the headlines are a bit deceiving today. I would concur with that. Actually, there's panic when it comes to Nifty constituents today and uh, probably the expiry factor is playing out. But let's look at the broader markets. There are some pockets which are also witnessing profit booking. Look at the jewellery stocks. TBZ, that's down almost 9 to 10 percent today. As you can see on your screen, 10 and a half percent cuts seen. And also you've got stocks like Gitanjali from the same space. Remember, the entire jewellery pack was going up on hopes of cuts in custom duty we don't know if actually uh, there is any development on that front or not but the stocks are definitely seeing some profit booking uh, some stocks in the broader markets have seen substantial gains from the likes of empty educare look at that it's almost trading at days high currently up almost 15 percent and not only empty educare you've also got stocks like mukta arts right from the word go in the morning session mukta arts saw those gains and look at that the chart they it sustained the gains despite of a weak market so that's a very positive sign Mukta is inching very closer to the circuit limit as well currently up almost 17 percent uh, Pradeep highlighted the tea stocks it's not only today actually tea stocks have been rallying since last week so look at stocks like McLeod Russell Harrison Malayalam I'm just out uh, I'm just going to highlight two stocks but the entire pack is up here 10 percent gains coming in from for Harrison and Zantu Realty Imami Infra are back in action remember these were the two stocks which were gaining in the last uh, two three weeks then took some breather some profit 
record booking was seen, but Zandu Realty is up almost 9.5%. And Imami Infra, where the circuit limit was down to almost 5%, so that's been locked in upper circuit since the morning session. Bad day for Reliance Naval again. Remember, the counter was down yesterday. Selling pressure continues, and this is also in the FNO space, so that's down almost closer to 4%. And uh, pull up TV18 broadcast, that counter has seen it's up almost four and a half percent so after a profit booking which was seen in the last two sessions Pradeep the counter is back in action and to me it looks like it's more of cash based buying which one is seeing on TV 18 broadcast definitely these stocks remain in focus and if you look at what is really happening now in last towards the last hour of trade there are a few stocks which continue to uh, reel under pressure you have Reliance Neville which is down another three and a half percent in fact it was trading flat it has fallen recently if you could bring up that chart uh, another such stock is GVK power and infra another high beta name which has come under pressure but uh, you know against that I can easily spot at least four or five stocks where fresh buying has also emerged for example uh, just look at uh, uh, Eris Life Sciences. The stock has gained another 4%. It's up close to 6% now, close to the day's high. Uh, you, you can also look at uh, Kamdhenu Limited, which is basically the, uh, the steel bar company. The stock is up around 5%, has hit the upper circuit, in fact, and this move has just about happened. Uh, if you look at Intrasoft Technologies, that is yet another stock which has moved up. Uh, La Opala, we, we were talking about this stock has moved up by 2%. Uh, Speciality Restro has seen some uh, buying coming in. So definitely when the indices are under pressure, when we are probably uh, heading for an expiry level which was not anticipated till yesterday, uh, it's not, not really that bad if you look at the broad market. Well, clearly as you know, you've highlighted that uh, uh, the sell-off which is, has been seen for uh, the FNO stocks probably today. It's the expiry factor which is playing about. So let's see what the trends from the uh, futures and options market currently indicate. The India WIX is still trading above the mark of 13. So volatility still continues to be on the higher side. Remember for the series also the volatility has been high. Uh, let's look at the options data then. Clearly the day belongs to the call writers. I'm sure they'll be rejoicing the kind of premium they've pocketed. We We've seen heavy, heavy call writing which has come in right from the morning session when the index had a gap down opening. Let's pull up that plate which will tell you which are the strikes exactly where the call writing has taken place today. Strikes starting from 10,250, 300 as well as 350. So all these strikes have seen significant amount of OI change which has come in. And as you can see, the premiums on these strikes have fallen significantly. Uh, what's the range that one can expect? Obviously expect more volatility in the last hour of trade. I'm not denying that. but until yesterday we were working with the range of 350 to 450 on the upside that range now has fallen to 10,000 three uh, 270 to about 10,000 350 on the upside but remember that support for support of 270 has already been breached in today's session so the if the index has to scale lower from these levels watch out for 10,250 that will be another support that you can watch out in today's session just a recap of the November series we started with this the, uh, we started the series when nifty was trading around the levels of 10,344. From thereabouts, it's corrected almost 60 to 65 points. But Bank Nifty, mind you, in this series has outperformed. We started the series somewhere around 25,000 levels. The Bank Nifty is still hovering around that mark of 25,550. But the volatility, as we mentioned, has been on the higher side. I think that number should be two on your screen. India VIX has actually gone up above the mark of 13, so 11.6. And right now, it's almost trading above the mark of 13. Uh, just two stocks I'm going to highlight. The stock futures, uh, Dabur has been pretty active today. It's seen very high volumes on the cash side. And look at that, the December future open interest is up almost 140%. So do watch out for the delivery data here because I was just checking the delivery data of yesterday. The percentage of deliverable quantity is, you know, uh, was above the 55% mark. So to me, once again, it looks like that there is more of cash-based buying, which one has seen on that. And if you could just pull up the rollover plate of Dabur, that will exactly tell you how the rollovers are currently stacking up. That's almost 48%. Uh, Jain Irrigation is the other counter which has been in focus. It has touched its fresh 52-week high. It's trading on very, very high volumes on the cash side. And in fact, the futures too have seen fresh long buildup coming about. The December futures, if you could just pull up that, it'll tell you how much exactly the open interest buildup has been seen. And that's about 63%, Pradeep. So we talked about this stock earlier this week uh, and we did mention that there is a fresh breakout and Jan Irrigation is moving up, holding on to that 
trade uh, that trend that's interesting but if you look at the index uh, if you could just pull up you know last uh, one month and three month uh, chart for nifty actually uh, you know like you mentioned Abhi, that probably 10,250 uh, could be an interesting level to watch I think 10,300 to 10,350 was a very significant support zone and yeah it's, it's possible that we'll find some support uh, you know at 10 to 50 or 10 to 100 but most important point is that when we corrected from you know close to 10,500 I think 10,484 90 was the high and we went all the way down to uh, around uh, 10,100 or even below that level for a while uh, after retracing from those lows we failed to cross the previous high so normally uh, you know traders who who don't look at technicals very deeply they still look at uh, you know the higher tops higher bottom or lower tops lower bottom kind of formation so here we have made a higher top uh, lower top i beg your pardon that would definitely be a concern and i won't be surprised if uh, you know in next series probably you'll have more traders positioning themselves either on the neutral side looking for uh, you know a straddle and strangle strategies right or kind of uh, 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 you know various other combinations of futures and options rather than taking uh, a naked long bet like they used to do till the current series so i think that would be an interesting point to discuss when our experts mm. join us Sure, and you've made a very pertinent point because Nifty was consolidating in the last four session and today's the day it's broken out of that range on the downside. And in terms of positioning also for the December series, the range is same as we were working out with the November series, 10,000 on the downside to about 10,500 on the upside. Well, that's about the markets. A bit of recovery also seen in the last 10 minutes when we've started the show. Nifty is currently at about 10,296 expiry day, so you can expect volatile moves to come about. Okay, then let's go across to our guest. We're joined by Joe Rundle, Director of Trading and Partnership at Think Markets, is joining us on the show now. Hi, Joe. Good afternoon from India, and thanks a lot for joining us uh, today on Bloomberg Quint. Well, we had the GDP numbers coming out of the U.S. markets yesterday, which actually surprised the street. We did see the U U.S. markets, you know, going up, but definitely Asia was very weak in the morning session today. Uh, I just want to check: Do you think this would signal shift of fund flows from? from emerging or Asian markets back to the US markets now? Yeah, I think so. And I think that's probably going to be one of the trends that continues, uh, certainly for the rest of the year, and probably is going to be the theme for uh, next year, a switch away from emerging markets into the US. I think uh, the US uh, economy uh, seems to have got over uh, the worries about the Trump administration and, and the unpredictability of it. And it seems that Trump is going to be uh, here for the long run. And I think he's going to be pro-business. So I think you will see a switch away um, as uh, he drives that forward. So I think that is the big trend and will continue uh, certainly for the rest of the year. Do you see uh, U.S. bond yields hardening further here on? And will that have an impact on uh, emerging market equities? Um, so uh, U.S. bond yields, I think it's going to be an interesting one. I don't think the Fed are going to raise uh, rates as fast as the market expects. I think there will be some. So that will put pressure on uh, the yields to come down. Um, but I do think overall there will be uh, a general switch away from funds. There will be a, a, a slight steepening of the curve in the U.S. And that will drive money away uh, as people have looked for yield uh, in emerging markets into the U.S. Uh, treasuries. Um, and that will put pressure, unfortunately, on emerging market equity indices. Mm. Uh, what's the outlook on the uh, European markets? How's the macro data panning out there? The European markets are a really interesting um, problem. You know, there's the overshadow of Brexit here in the UK. It looks like they're beginning to sort of reach some form of a deal. But I think the overall markets in Europe have got underlying weakness there. Um, the Brexit is going to cast a shadow over it and, and there's going to be a lot of investment that's not being put to work. So I think um, the actual underlying economies in Europe, you've got a two-tone one, you've got Germany very strong and then the rest of Europe pretty weak. Um, and I think the trends uh, there will continue. So I think you will see uh, money flowing into the DAX, uh, the German index, but the rest of the markets are going to be weak, especially as you see um, domestic tensions like we saw in Spain and the threat of a breakup of the European uh, Union. And that could accelerate if we get a messy Brexit and we get other countries uh, beginning to split away. So I think there's a, 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 a question mark over Europe. Germany as a whole will be strong, but the rest of the Europe uh, I would stay away from. 
Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, you know, German bond yield and some other European bond yields have also hardened. Uh, Bank of England managed to, uh, uh, you know, finally take a rate hike recently. Uh, what do you think, to, to what extent have markets been prepared or are actually preparing for higher yields or further uh, rate hikes or tightening or unwinding of, uh, uh, you know, bond buying programs? Uh, and do you really think that uh, equity markets may have to uh, see a lot of volatility going forward because of what is happening uh, with central banks? So I think central bank policy uh, in Europe is confusing to say the least. I think the uh, UK market um, probably does need higher interest rates to combat inflation, but the Bank of England really is in a, a, a difficult position. Um, the, the, the recovery we've seen in the UK is built solely on credit, um, and we're going back into a 2008-esque consumer bubble uh, of credit, and that's really going to put pressure on the Bank of England and central banks. Uh, raising interest rates and so you're going to get probably a period of very high inflation um, than wanting to move interest rates up and, and not being able to. So I think that's a very difficult thing. I think the UK economy is um, very, very risky. Uh, the ECB again because of the two-tone split in Europe I don't think will um, move that quickly, uh, probably slower than the market anticipates, whereas actually what they probably need to do is move faster than the market anticipates. So the long-term uh, outlook for the European economy I think is pretty poor, um, certainly compared to emerging markets and the US economy. Hmm. Uh, Joe, it's been a great, great year for uh, global equities and clearly uh, the gains have been fueled by the kind of liquidity that one has seen in the global equities market this time around. Uh, if I were to ask you what can derail this move, which are the factors uh, that dominate your mind right now that could actually uh, trigger the sell-off in the equities market? So I think you're going to see, I think people are, are unconvinced about this equity rally and we've actually seen that for some period of time. So I think uh, it is uh, difficult. I think you're going to see a grind up and unless there is a significant change somewhere and that could be a geopolitical move, um, we could see an escalation of North Korea. You could see a breakup, like I said earlier, about the uh, of the European uh, Union and I think that's a very real possibility. I would put that at over 50% in the next two years that we get a disorderly exit and uh, further countries breaking away. And I think uh, uh, it's going to be something big uh, like one of those events that causes uh, a sharp sell-off. But until we see something big and we just see weak data or mildly weak data, I think you are going to see a continued grind up. But people are going to be shorting into this and it's going to be have all the characteristics of a short squeeze um, generally pushing up. So I don't think there's going to be one uh, small thing that comes in. And I think the likelihood of uh, a big thing uh, coming in will cause a significant sell off. But again, it's almost a black swan type event. Okay, Joe, thanks a lot for joining us today and giving us your views on the global equities markets. Okay, moving back to India, uh, let's talk about the mid-cap real estate companies and the one which has been in focus and rather a good rally has been seen and I'm talking about a company called SunTech Realty. The stock has gained for almost six out of the last seven sessions on the sidelines of the Motilal Oswal mid-cap conference. Joining us uh, to discuss the road ahead for the company is is Sumesh Mishra, COO at Suntec Realty. And Saloni Danuka from our research team also joins in on the conversation. Saloni, take it away. Thank you for that, Navneet. Uh, good afternoon, sir. For first up, let's talk about your second quarter earnings. Uh, the top line as well as bottom line has fared pretty well. Uh, but however, the margins were under pressure and has come down sequentially. So what is the reason for that? Has the funding cost uh, gone up? So, in fact, uh, if you see, in the last uh, one year or so, we have been able to reduce our uh, cost of, uh, you know, borrowing, uh, and we are hardly, you know, a negligible debt, uh, you know, balance sheet. So, in fact, we have been able to bring down the cost to negligible, uh, you know, uh, single digit nine to nine point two five percent. Primarily, the reason of uh, the PNL, uh, you know, showing a comparatively lesser margin was because of the first time booking of our Gorigao project, which is Suntec City Avenue 1 and Avenue 2, which is in a location called ODC, Oshivra District Centre in Gorigao West. So this was the first time booking where the average realisation or the historical uh, sales had happened at a slightly lesser levels. 
so because it was the booking of a historical or a legacy sales we the the profitability was lesser because of the earlier realizations now we have been able to up the realization in the last 2 years so incrementally you will see the margins from that project increasingly you know uh, going well on a you know in a at a higher levels in the coming quarters all right and how many units have you sold uh, in your premium segment that is bkc and your new project that is odc project in goregaon in this particular quarter uh see in the, this quarter the focus uh, for the company level was uh, at the odc goregaon west project in suntec city we were able to sell about 80 apartments in this quarter itself and out of 80 apartments which gave us a in terms of operational numbers it gave us a sales of close to 150 crore rupees uh with regards to our uh, bkc projects we were in this quarter we were able to sell one apartment and those are big ticket size apartments uh, i think it was close to 25 crore rupees worth of apartment that we sold this year in this quarter okay and uh, how is the demand from consumers looking post demonetization gst as well as rera does impact of these even still continue or is it behind us so i think uh, slowly but surely uh, the real estate sector is uh, coming out of uh, these three jolts that uh, you know uh, the industry suffered and uh, post uh, rera again uh, rera got implemented in the first quarter so i think uh, this quarter uh, people have started uh, you know again uh, coming back into the market they have been clearly able to differentiate the good brands uh, and uh, that's the reason you will see uh, you will you would have seen that last quarter uh, incrementally uh, you know especially in the mid mid market level the uh, traction has been good and uh, i think going forward in the next one or two quarters you will see uh, the numbers only go- improving better for the good brands and the organized developers so i think uh, yeah for us for a organized player and a you know uh, branded player like us uh, the going uh, for uh, for the next two to two to three quarters and incrementally looks uh, on a very good positive footing and so how is the uh Are you looking for any inorganic growth and what was the reason behind raising QIP of 500 crore rupees in this particular quarter So uh, you know we are uh, looking at a uh, couple of good opportunities uh, first of all uh, you know at a at a company level we are looking at uh, two to three uh, segments in which we would want to grow uh, at this juncture because uh, we look at lot of opportunities with our strong balance sheet Uh, we were although although we were uh, you know having very low levels of debt we thought uh, that it will be prudent enough to raise uh, capital at this juncture uh, because we are looking at these three uh, very good opportunities first is uh, uh, setting up a commercial uh, rental portfolio in uh, our property in goregaon west in odc which is a commercial hub so there is a lot of demand in that micro market and we look forward to creating a rental portfolio of about 2 to 2.6 million square feet and uh, since the land is already there and we have established that project under our suntec city brand uh, we feel that uh, you know uh, uh, you know capitalizing on the commercial uptake and that micro markets uh, you know being a, um, a commercial hub we want to establish uh, this portfolio of rental uh, you know asset in the coming 3 to 4 years and the second opportunity that we uh, look forward is an affordable housing foray and uh, the third opportunity we look forward is a distressed uh, assets which have been offered to us so there are opportunity of lot of distressed uh, properties coming to us and uh, we can look at uh, you know both the opportunities of organic as well as inorganic growth to capitalize on uh, you know in these times where uh, there are a lot of such opportunities available in both these segments and uh, you know so in terms of affordable to capitalize on this uh, you know uh, the uh, the pradhan mantri awas yojana and the thrust on the affordable segment we would want to uh, you know encash on that opportunity as well and uh, as i said in terms of uh, distressed assets also we would want to encash uh, on on such op- so many opportunities where uh, developers and landlords are coming to us and uh, we can look at some good opportunity and uh, create more return on equity So yeah that was the primarily the reason of uh, raising so there is 500 crore rupees which is coming from the QI which came from the QIP investors and uh, additionally about 151 crore rupees is coming from the promoters uh, towards the pref allotment uh, which will help uh, the company to you know uh, in terms of total inflow it's about 650 crore rupees of new capital which comes into the company and uh, makes the company virtually a zero debt company so if you take into account this 650 crore uh we will be at about 135 crore rupees of debt and a net worth of about 2500 crore rupees 
So this gives us a wherewithal of, uh, you know, or a, you can say a war chest to, you know, uh, grow from this level to another level uh, in the next uh, coming two to three years. Also, sir, talking about your affordable uh, housing business, uh, the company's presentation did mention that uh, the company is looking to develop their fifth brand for low-cost housing. So, sir, what kind of timeline are you looking at? Because the press release clearly said that it is coming very soon. So, what kind of timeline are you looking at, sir? So, uh, we have been obviously, uh, uh, you know, into uh, uh, ultra luxury and a luxury segment in terms of uh, the residential offerings that the company has offered till now. So, we have uh, four brands under our portfolio, as we would have seen uh, in our corporate presentation. So, we have Signature, which is a uber luxury brand. Then we have Signia, which is a standalone luxury brand in every micro market. Then we have Suntech City brand, which is for our large format mixed use township projects. And uh, then we have the Suntech brand, which is for our commercial projects. So to have a play in this mid-market uh, or a mid-value housing, uh, you know, for a, we are looking to create a fifth brand. So obviously we don't want to compromise on our luxury and super luxury segment branding. And uh, for this new segment that we are looking forward and we want to be present in all the, you know, uh, segments of uh, the residential housing in MMR region. So this segment uh, will be helping us. Uh, we'll be trying to put this segment under a new brand. So we'll be shortly announcing we are working on this fifth brand and uh, hopefully you should see us, us launching and we're working very aggressively on this. So you should be looking, uh, you know, uh, we, sh we should be looking forward to launch this uh, pretty soon. Also, sir, my last question to you is uh, going ahead, what are the growth plans for company? Uh, are you looking for any new buying? If yes, then at what geographies are you looking at and the ticket size of the same? So, uh, you know, uh, since we are placed very well in terms of the balance sheet strength, as uh, you know, I said earlier that uh, we enjoy a, almost a zero debt or a very negligible debt uh, uh, number on a, on a balance sheet per se with a net worth of 2,500 crore. So we have a good funding capabilities to go, you know, uh, ticket size is not a problem for us. Uh, it is more of opportunity and meeting the philosophy of uh, generating higher IRRs and return on equity. So the focus will be obviously to attain uh, higher IRRs and uh, ROIs which we have been achieving over the last five to six years. Number two is in terms of our geographical uh, focus, we have always been a Mumbai focused player or an MMR region which is Mumbai metropolitan region uh, focused player and we will want to continue uh, to look for opportunities in that segment uh, and in these locations. So going forward, uh, we will continue to play on our strength and uh, work on uh, certain opportunities in uh, MMR region. So in 2018, uh, you would see us, uh, you know, uh, uh, making some uh, good, uh, you know, deploying this capital and uh, growing the company, uh, you know, uh, the way we have grown in the last five to six years. We will continue to grow at a, at a good pace and uh, we will want to capitalize on our good brand positioning and our balance sheet strength and our presence in Mumbai metropolitan region. So this is the fundamental on which we will like to grow in the coming uh, in the coming year of uh, FI 1890. All right, sir. It was a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, so that was the management of uh, Suntech Realty. Uh, quite confident about improving their margins in coming quarters on the back of realizations of their ODC project in Goregaon. So over to you, Namit. Thanks for that, Saloni. And well, this is the company which has clearly given, given its shareholders good returns. If you look at this counter on a to D basis, it has seen substantial gains. I think it's up almost 275%. That's the chart there on your screen. And remember, the FI holding too in this company has been going up. So from September quarter, where it was just about 7%, it's not, it now stands at about uh, 10%. But let's shift focus back to the markets. Let's pull up Nifty. It's above the 10,000. 300 mark currently at about 10,310. So from those lower levels, we are seeing a bit of recovery, but the bank nifty is just about at 25,578. Let's put spotlight then on Ambuja Cement. This is the stock that Pradeep's been tracking today on the chart. Pradeep, what's interesting on the charts with, uh, with regard to Ambuja Cement? Uh, well, uh, I think there is some, uh, there is a little bit of technical problem here because uh, we should be able to see a trend line here which is not not definitely coming so if you look at this low that was hit in december 2016 and then just look at a trend here you join it with the lows of june you will find a trend line that 
comes exactly to the current level that is around 260 265 so there is a strong long term trend line support and a trend line uh, you know that covers almost a year's time is definitely a very strong indicator very strong support or resistance whichever way it goes so that is one also look at uh, you know another interesting uh, thing which is this this curve that you can see the yellow color line this is basically a 200 days moving average and we have reached very close to it the 200 dma is at 256 roughly eight to nine rupees from the current market price of abuja cement so that is the second support indicator which is coming here also if you look at it uh, you know recently if you just focus on the movement over the last two to three week, three months you'll find that it has made kind of a double top at the higher level and the confirmation of that will come if the stock breaks below 260 and closes below 260 or 256 to confirm a breakdown below 200 DMA as well. In that case, probably, uh, uh, you know, it turns into a bear case. And that is the reason, precisely the reason why uh, we are calling it is a make or break because we are not yet sure. In fact, uh, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the, uh, the technical analysis and, and some of the cardinal rules of technical analysis you don't call it a bottom unless you have a strong indicator which is telling you that okay there is a bottom like for example i have to have a strong green uh, 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 you know candle here maybe that crosses the recent uh, uh, highs or a swing high and it, it tells you that market has decisively bottomed or the stock has decisively bottomed there is no such indicator that is why there is a small question mark but these are the important support levels that the stock is currently negotiating and looks like it should uh, bottom from here unless there is a crack in the market itself and then 200 DMA can be broken. In that case, the long term trend line can also be breached and you will see lower levels. But unless th that scenario really plays out, in all probability, Gujarat Ambuja should be uh, should figure among the uh, big gainers for the December series. That is the indicator. And one more point before I, I toss it back to Navneet. Look at RSI. This is uh, uh, the curve that you see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, this is, uh, I would say, classical movement in RSI that moves between 30 and 70. And for last one year, you can see most of the time, it kind of honors both the extremes and, and, and it plays very well with the Gujarat Ambuja's price movement. That is not very often that you see this kind of a move. RSI is now not making newer lows while stock is still under pressure. So that is yet another indicator, uh, even on oscillators, that probably stock is very close to the bottom. So you can put a stop loss at around 255 levels and try and go long. That is what the chart is telling us. That is just the, uh, the technical principle here, but this is definitely not a recommendation from my side to trade, but an in interesting level and in interesting pattern that I'm trying to highlight here. No. Well, clearly, as Pradeep highlighted, I uh, just want to reiterate that this is not a trading recommendation. This is just uh, Pradeep uh, tries to figure out a couple of stocks which look interesting on the charts. Uh, well, on that note, let's uh, move ahead and get our technical guest on the show to get some views going. Sachitanan Uttekar, AVP of Technicals at Trade Bulls, is joining us on the show now. Hi, Sachitanan. Good afternoon and thanks a lot for joining us. Well, clearly, one is witnessing volatile moves in the last one hour or so we did see the index uh, you know breaching the 10,300 mark but once again it's b back below the level of 10,300 currently at about 288 uh, would you initiate any position at current level such on the index well uh, good evening uh, in fact uh, the way we have been uh, you know looking at this entire setup you know, we have been recommending our clients at 10,400 looks like a near-term resistance and uh, markets may not sustain these levels. So, uh, you know, uh, this is the first leg, uh, uh, you know, wherein uh, we are uh, confident that uh, the move that has commenced today, you know, could have a domino effect uh, in this particular, uh, in the coming expiry as well. So, you know, in fact, uh, the kind of bounce back that we are seeing right now towards 10,300, you know, this is again an opportunity to create some short positions. In fact, uh, you know, one needs to understand that the overall trend uh, you know has started uh, more or less now on the declining side and probably one should start uh, looking at pullbacks to create short positions so keeping a stop loss somewhere close to say 10366 on a immediate basis you know short positions can be initiated 
for an initial target uh, uh, close to say around 10170 which could be witnessed in the coming week so clearly you know the the, uh, the stance on the market is you know utilize the pullbacks to create short positions and the direction uh, from here on should be on the negative side Okay, so the, uh, the momentum seems to be on the downside is what Sachdan is highlighting. Before I uh, uh, ask him about his trading strategy, just I want to highlight, uh, address the flashes which are there on the screen. Uh, the April, till, uh, April to October fiscal deficit has come in at about 5.25 lakh crore and that's reached the 96.1% of FI18 target of 5.47 lakh crore. Remember the fiscal deficit target given by the government for FI18 is about 3 0.2% and April to October fiscal deficit has uh, come in at 4 lakh crore versus 3.22 lakh crore uh, which was estimated for FI18 and October only for the month of October fiscal deficit is at about 26,400 crore. So do watch out for those numbers, some important macro data are coming by and clearly that's uh, been in focus whether the government will be able to meet its fiscal deficit target for this financial year or not. Especially uh, uh, Pradeep, after the PSU bank recapitalization, I believe after that was announced, you know, these questions were raised whether they will fail to reach the target. But I guess the FM later emphasized that they are trying very hard to at least meet the target for this year. Definitely, and fiscal deficit targets will probably be met, but what is also interesting, we, we have seen this trend because now you have already spent 96% of what you could probably, you know, roughly speaking, already. Uh, just to maintain the uh, target at 3.2%, uh, there could be some cuts in uh, the capital expenditure, which is easy to cut, and it has already been spotted that some states have, have started doing that already. That would have some negative impact. So wouldn't that growth. have, imp I was just coming Definitely. to that, so you cut down the capital expenditure, that will have an impact on the growth then? Definitely. So that, that's what economists really call, you know, the quality of deficit versus the quantity. So you, you might still reach your target, but the way you manage it is also important and significant. Uh, and that has a bearing on what experts think about you, what uh, FII investors think of you, and even what rating agencies uh, what sure. kind of comment do they uh, give on such issues then? And clearly these numbers will have a bearing on the markets on a longer term basis, not in the short term, but uh, we'll watch out for the overall numbers for FI18, whether the target of 3.2% is met or not. I'll go back to Sachdanan and take his uh, trading strategies for the day. Sachdanan, uh, any individual stocks that you're focusing on? Well, I've shared uh, two strategies uh, primarily from an objective of trading the uh, coming expiry. ICSA Prudential is uh, one particular stock which has uh, again faced some pressure and uh, we are expecting that uh, this particular pressure may continue in the uh, coming days ahead. So short positions can be initiated in the December futures, keeping a stop loss somewhere close to 384.30 and we are expecting a downside close to say 350-347 mark. On the uh, long side, we have IDFC, uh, which has been very consistent. The stock has been, you know, consolidating within the particular range, and we expect uh, that uh, there could be a rebound back to say 69, 70 kind of a zone again. So probably, you know, keeping a stop loss somewhere close to 59, uh, long positions can be initiated in IDFC from here on. Okay, uh, Jay Bala will join us uh, in a while, and we'll take his uh, trading strategy as well. But for now, let's go across to our fundamental guest, Santosh Singh, ED Research at Hai Tong Securities, uh, India is in the studio. Santosh, uh, many thanks for coming in. Uh, how do you really see the markets, you know, this entire series, uh, we have seen some kind of selling pressure at higher levels. Institutions, uh, I would say the trend is mixed, although FII started buying a bit uh, once again in the month of November. Uh, are you optimistic or are you waiting for a correction? See, I mean, see, if I talk about waiting for a correction, means people have waited for a correction for a very long time. So, <laughs> July, I was uh, saying. Yeah, so the correction, waiting for correction has happened for a very long time. Now, <clears throat> do I see that if I'm a two-year or three-year investor, if I would buy in the market, yes, I would. But if I'm looking from a shorter duration perspective, definitely the markets are not really cheap. They are expensive and they are trading at one of their peak valuations. So the markets are not cheap, but if I'm looking from a longer term perspective, it makes sense. Now the only problem here is the flows, because that's, that's the bigger trigger. The flows are still positive, and domestic flows are still positive. And now suddenly we are seeing some FII flow also turning positive. So can the market fall? If the flows are positive, the markets can't fall. So, so that's where I think if, if I'm looking from a shorter term perspective, I may not be a buyer. But simply if I'm expecting markets to fall, very difficult. 
Hmm. You know, we had uh, the GDP numbers coming out of yeah. the U.S. markets yesterday, which beat uh, the street estimates. And usually, it's a trend. Uh, maybe now, if the U.S. Fed goes ahead and increase uh, their yeah. rates, uh, I'm sure the FIs would like to park their money in a developed market vis-a-vis -vis the emerging yeah. market. So far, the money was flowing in because the rates yeah. were down there. Uh, do you see that happening? If, in case if the rate hike comes about, uh, can there be brunt of outflows from the Indian markets? So there could be because uh, what is happening for last almost like three or four quarters is that India has been regularly being downgraded and the world has been upgraded. So that's, that's a trend which has happened and that's why we have seen so much of outflow which has happened in the first uh, five or six months from the from the Indian domestic market. So, so and when you say downgrade, you mean to say it, uh, the reducing GDP the weightage? Okay, GDP. The GDP okay. growth has been consistently been uh, downgraded by, and, and the, the world GDP growth has been upgraded uh, on a regular basis. So that, and that would have meant that Indian market should have fallen. But as I said, the global money has been flowing out from the market. It has been flowing out for a very long time now, almost six, seven months. It's just recently it has turned positive. But given the domestic flows, we have been able to maintain our market position. But now the expectation is that there will be sort of, again, the growth might come back because I was looking at a lot of uh, now notes from, from very various strategies. So we are talking about now EPS upgrades because a lot of EPS upgrades have already happened also. Now looking at 2020, we are talking about almost like 20% EPS growth. So if, if those numbers can be met, and I've always doubted that, means we have always downgraded after forecasting, because that has been the trend. But if th those numbers can be met, then I don't think there is there's a possibility of uh, outflow. But yes, I, I doubt that we might be able to see that 20% EPS growth in FY19 and 20. Correct. In fact, if you look at it, you know, another uh, number which has come out today, uh, the PMI data from China is also positive. So there is growth everywhere and yeah. let's hope that our own GDP number will also keep pace with that 6.2% uh, of a GVA forecast and 64 is the GDP yeah. uh, estimate, so to say, uh, that, that Bloomberg and Bloomberg Quint uh, have, have been sharing with the viewers. Uh, well, you know, there is an all-important meeting of oil producers as well. And tomorrow morning when we come back, we'll, we'll know the outcome. Uh, do you think market has discounted it or do we have reasons to worry and wait and watch? Well, definitely the way Brent is moving up, we have reasons to worry because that was the biggest reason why our current account deficit was so much under control. Our balance of payments were under control and main point is our forex was under control. So if the Brent were to move anyway directionally in, uh, in a different direction, then it's, it's a worry for us and specifically when we are talking about the election years. So we don't want deficit from that front coming in. So definitely it's, it's, uh, we, definitely it's, it's something which our market would be willing to look at. Uh, just want to highlight India Bulls real estate, if you could just uh, pull up that counter and I also want to remind our viewers, uh, December contract is the last contract that the stock remains in the FNO uh, uh, market. So it's moved up from day's low, currently trading almost at day's high, gains of closer to 4% at levels of 218, I'll just get a technical check on this. Sachdanan on the charts, a sharp recovery on India Bulls real estate, uh, is it uh, triggering anything on the charts, would you take any fresh position here? Well, uh, the move uh, is more of a consolidation. Uh, we are not looking at uh, this particular price action as a breakout. But probably, yes, uh, the stock has been oscillating within 205 on the lower side and 225, 230 on the higher side. So probably we may see an oscillation or an oscillating range uh, getting continued uh, in, the, in the coming days. But certainly not a breakout. Okay. Uh, if you look at some more stocks, look at Den Networks, which has given a swing of around 6% on the higher side, is up 7.5%, 8 8% now. You also have Marathon Next Gen, which has gained 6%. Uh, of late, we have seen a lot of interest in real estate. In fact, Marathon is uh, yet another real estate uh, stock. We're just talking about IB Real. We have seen uh, the names like Purvankara moving up, Kolte Patil developers. So basically, second rung uh, reality uh, stocks have, have been buzzing off late. Uh, do you think there is a fundamental reason behind it? Uh, are, are you bullish on real estate at this point of time? Well, see, the problem with real estate, it's not about the being bullish on real estate sector. I think real estate sector can do well. But it's very difficult always to find out stocks where mm. you can be comfortable with. So our problem has been that, to find out stocks where we can be really comfortable with. 
But as such, if you look at real estate, I think the basic data which was coming out, that mm. is the uh, affordable housing sales is moving up. And that might be causing the second run players to move up because they have, there, there is some data showing that offer, there, there is a recovery in the real estate market itself, affordable housing sales moving up. But let's see when, how it goes on, but we don't cover the sector at all. because. So when you data. say you're not comfortable, are you not comfortable with the valuations because most of these companies are over leveraged? Uh, not really the valuations, it's, it's, uh, the balance sheets, and even uh, means the way it has been till now, the way the sector has worked. But don't you think then you may have missed out on the rally because affordable housing is the theme which majority of the fund houses are saying yeah. it could be one of the biggest themes in Asia now. That's what Chris Wood of CLSA highlighted. I would I would not doubt that, that affordable housing is a could be a big thing for for the developers. But finding the real question is finding the right company to to invest in. That has been our problem. We are not negative on the theme. The theme is great. But finding the right company is difficult for us. That's why we don't look at the sector as per se. <laughs> okay, so that's the view coming on real estate. Jay Bala, Chief Market Technician at CashTheChaos.com is joining us now. Uh, Jay, good afternoon. Uh, what are your uh, key trading ideas this afternoon that you would like to share with our viewers? See, uh, if you look at the banking space, you know, uh, it's showing divergent behaviors. Some of them are likely to outperform, while the, uh, you know, uh, some of them are likely to uh, go down with the Nifty. Uh, with that idea in mind, uh, I think uh, we've been uh, neutral on Indus and Bank for some time now. We've been repeating that for a uh, couple of weeks now. And uh, if you look at Indus and Bank, from the September highs, it's been clocking lower lows and lower tops. And it's uh, currently placed in an ideal place where the, the resistance is likely to kick in and the next leg of downtrend is likely to uh, begin. And so, you know, if one were to place a stop above 1700 for uh, uh, Indus and Bank, I think it's heading somewhere close to uh, uh, 15, even 1550. So, you know, uh, look out for a short trade here. And another uh, good uh, medium-term bet from the auto space is actually, uh, to be more precise, it's the auto ancillary space. If you look at Amara Raja batteries, um, uh, for, it's been you know uh, going through a, a sort of consolidation in the longer term. Two, uh, the highs it made in 2015. From that point onwards, it's been quite choppy. And uh, you know recently, you know a couple of uh, weeks ago, it had a sharp low closer to 660, and then it was uh, it saw a very strong price rejection. That's telling us the medium-term uh, consolidation is done, and it's trying to resume the next uh, uh, level of the uptrend. So I think that stock is uh, poised for 52-week uh, highs. So from the current level uh, of, of about uh, you know closer to 800, 780, I think uh, if it had even dropped to 750, it'd be an ideal entry point. But I don't know you're going to get that point. But from this level onwards, I'm seeing 1,200 record uh, record high for the stock, and uh, that's a good play to a good place to be there. Mm. Jay, I don't know if today's move are largely got to do with the expiry day or because the Asian markets were also weak in the morning. But uh, do you think uh, the index can uh, recover from these levels and one can look to take any sort of position at these lower levels? See, uh, the index is actually equally poised for you know both the upside and the downside. You know, uh, 10,400. The market has been facing some resistance. You know, two uh, two weeks ago, I said uh, the market has to come down at least to 10,100. But looking at the price movements from 10,490 to 10,090 10, odds, you know, to me it looks a bit incomplete or a, a little bit short than the ideal level for a correction. And if the market were to go down one more level closer to that, you know, uh, 10,000 mark. I think uh, that'll be a, a complete correction and look, it'll have the right look. So once the market can go to, uh, you know, uh, 10,050 or, you know, closer to that sort of level, I think this correction can be labeled complete. Um, and, and then uh, we, we can look for further record highs for the market. But if the markets were to go uh, to fresh record highs from current levels, that will not be ideal from a longer term perspective. It will kick in a lot of negatives. Uh, so uh, at the moment, I'm looking at the, po I'm, I'm giving a probability of market going down uh, a higher chance rather than mar market, uh, you know, clocking record highs. So, and I would say, you know, it's more than a 60, 40, 60 in favor of uh, the decline and 40 in favor of the uh, new record highs. And how would you really trade that view? At what level would you look to short? Trading the index is a bit difficult, but you know, uh, once again, you got to play through the put options here. I think you know, if you can um, position yourself on the 10,000 uh, December put, I think that'll uh, that'll be an ideal entry point. It'll, uh, it, if if it were to go 
to where, where we anticipated to go. I think that will e easily double from current levels. And you know, um, it, it's unlikely that uh, it, it, it need not uh, go uh, in the money. 10,000 put may not become in the money, but you know, it will come close to it. So the premiums are likely to appreciate. That's a good uh, possibility of you know making more money and profiting profiting from the uh, current uh, you know down leg in the extreme short term. Mm. And as we speak, I guess the Bank Nifty is almost trading at its day's low. We've seen a very sharp uh, cut coming in for the PSU uh, banking space. The Nifty PSU Bank is now down almost 1.6%. So that too is around the day's low. So watch out for the financials. They have been in focus in the last few sessions. But moving on to the buzzing stock of the day. And to take us through the same, Nikki Merchandani joins us. Hi, Nikki. Hi, so the buzzing stock today is Trivandas Bhimji Zaveri. The stock has declined as much as 16.15% today, which is the single biggest intraday loss since demonetization. If you look, the stock has recovered some of its lost ground, but still continues to trade with losses of nearly 10 odd percent. Volumes remain high at 10 times its 30 day average volumes on NSE. Not just TBZ, a bunch of other jewelry stocks are trading lower in trade today, be it in likes of Rajesh exports, PC dwellers, Tara dwellers, they all are trading lower. Also, <coughs> excuse me, uh, what is really not working for TBZ is uh, the disappointing show that the company has put up in terms of Q2 numbers. Revenue has come down by 27% at a number of around 326 crore as compared to a number of 445 crore in the corresponding quarter. Net profit has come down by 90 odd percent for this company in this quarter at a number which is less than 1 crore as compared to nearly 7.9 crore in the corresponding quarter. Margins for that matter also have been disappointing. They have come in at 3.7% as compared to 5.2% in the corresponding quarter. Now lower sales combined with your higher tax outgo is what is really hurting the margins or for that matter the bottom line performance of the company. Also what is the other highlight for the company? The company demands a higher peer, a valuation as compared to its peers. Uh, it's trading at a PE, a trailing 12-month PE of nearly 56 times as against 30 times seen by PC Jero and nearly <coughs> 19 times seen by uh, Rajesh Exports. But then the good part is the stock has seen decent run both in terms of YTD as well as yearly per, uh, performance and has given a return of more than 60% for that matter. Thanks, Nikki, for uh, this update. So, TBZ is down 10%. What is also interesting, you know, last week when PC dwellers started moving up on the back of a bullish report coming from Motilal Oswal Securities, uh, it took the entire sector along. So, we also had TBZ moving up along with that. We had stocks like Tangamail Jewelry moving up. Now, today, if you look at it, uh, other than TBZ, Gitanjali Gems is down 5 6%. Tangamail Jewelry is also down 5%. So now the, the entire sector is moving actually in a similar direction. So I don't know whether you should look at the positive numbers from PC or uh, Titan for that matter, or should you focus on Trivandas Bhimji, which has disappointed a bit. Uh, but Sachin Anand, what does charts really tell you? Uh, what is your view? Would you like to pick up any of these gems and jewelry stocks at this level? Well, uh, one particular uh, stock that uh, you know, we have been uh, tracking is PC Jewelers. In fact, the way the stock saw breakout close to 380 levels and the way we have seen the swing uh, again getting re-established uh, near that particular breakout zone. So this is one particular counter that uh, should be on your radar uh, for this particular expiry. The way uh, you know this breakout has happened, uh, you know, we are expecting levels close to around 455 to be witnessed in a uh, uh, you know, couple of months from here. And the trajectory has uh, been more on the long side itself. So any decline uh, in a counter like this should be utilized to create long positions. The overall pattern is indicating a price target somewhere close to 455. So of the uh, entire jewelry space, I think uh, the structure itself for PC jewelers looks promising. And we would like to you know, bet long uh, in this particular counter. Okay, so that's the call coming in. PC jewelers uh, looks like the best pick in this segment as yet. Uh, moving on to commodities now, OPEC members uh, are meeting in Vienna today to, dis to discuss the likely extension of the output cuts to December 2018. What could be the likely impact of this move? Sam uh, Alderson, uh, crude oil analyst at Energy Aspects, joins us now on the show. Sam, good afternoon from India. Uh, 
what do you expect? Do you think that uh, they'll probably decide for a three months extension and a review in June 2018 once again, or there will be one time extension by nine months all the way to December 18? Yeah, so we think that they will extend uh, through the back end of the year. Um, Saudi acutely aware that the market is expecting a nine month extension, uh, and anything less than that is uh, going to leave prices a little bit soft uh, heading into the new year uh, when balances look weaker with refinery maintenance in the first quarter of the year. Um, the main um, sort of issue behind that is Russia. Um, there is a broad agreement at the top level um, for a nine month extension, but some of the companies within that make up Russian production uh, have been slightly um, concerned about some issues with, with regards to uh, pro further project delays uh, by agreeing to a nine month extension and also where exiting the agreement in nine month times leave them. Um, the weather gets particularly cold in Russia uh, in Q4, Q1. Uh, so if they were to agree to December, um, they would effectively won't be able to raise a output until about April uh, 2019. Um, but yeah, we do, we do think there, um, with a few details to be decided on today, they will agree to an extension beyond um, to the end of next year. Okay, uh, but you know, uh, we, we did hear some voices coming from Russia that when, when crude has already appreciated to 65 uh, odd levels, uh, there is probably not, not, not really a need to extend by nine months and, and, and look for deeper production cut. Uh, it could also be counterproductive in, in some sense because US production has been going up. Do you think there is an agreement between OPEC and non-OPEC countries, including Russia, on the strategic intent and the kind of outcomes that they really expect? Uh, I think everyone's laser focused on this, uh, trying to bring inventory levels back to the five-year average. Um, so there has been talk about higher prices, but I think everyone welcomes higher prices. Uh, that was the point of the agreement, to bring inventory levels down and to help raise prices into around this level. Um, I think Shell is there, but given how strong demand growth has been over the past three years, I think everyone accepts some growth from the US is necessary to try and balance this market. That will definitely happen. And then, uh, you know, at the end, what could be the target levels for Brent and NYMEX, uh, say by December this year and then by March or June? Uh, if we get a nine month agreement, I think uh, you know, the market's largely priced that in um, for the back end of the next year. Um, as I said earlier, uh, Q1 next year looks, balances look relatively soft. Um, you've got increase in US production. At the same time, you've got quite significant refinery maintenance, particularly in the Middle East. Um, but from then on, uh, you know, we should be back in and around this range. Uh, and then really, you know, the, the outlook further on starts to look tighter uh, as we get, um, you know, a dearth of um, new projects coming online uh, 2019, 2020. Uh, and given how strong oil demand has been over the recent years. Is there any probability of crude hitting $70 or uh, going beyond that in 2018? Uh, I'd say it's, a, it's an outside chance towards the back end of the year. Um, but yeah, you know, the start of the year, um, we do have those, those hurdles. But you know, the market should tighten a bit. Um, but really, the, you know, the uptick we see is slightly later on. Um, yeah, we've got quite a. We, yeah, we should see quite a significant amount of U.S. oil production growth next year, which should, you know, roughly help balance the market. Okay. Uh, in fact, there's a news coming in uh, from from Bloomberg. Actually, Iraq has mentioned that an agreement has been reached between OPEC uh, countries. In principle, agree to nine months extension. So they're only only uh, they have mentioned OPEC, and they are not really quoting the non-OPEC countries whether or not they have agreed to concur with the OPEC producers. So nine months agreement has been in principle, uh, in principle approved by the OPEC countries. That is a quote from so this, Iraqi this delegate. means that uh, till December, right? Because until now they had uh, said till March, right? Yeah, so till March is definitely, it's, it's, it's yeah. already there, but if you extend it by nine months, which means you are now extending it to December, December 2018. 2018. So that is, uh, if, if they finally agree to this uh, figure, this is, uh, more or less discounted. Okay. That's what our uh, experts. And largely, the consensus is that they will prolong the supply cuts till December. Yeah, yeah. that 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 is 
So uh, one last question. I, I did get your point that you know going beyond 70 looks difficult, but you said maybe uh, in the early part of the year uh, we may see some softness. If if I heard you uh, correctly, you know what could be the range or or the price levels that you have projected so far for the Q1, Q2. Um, so you know, if we if we manage to get the agreement today, uh, and you know there isn't too much. Um, fine details that need to be looked at um, you know we should cling on to above 60 by the end of the year and you know we usually see softness um, so you know prices shouldn't fall too far um, they should remain relatively around the $60 mark um, uh, but yeah as I say um, just a little bit of seasonal softness in Q1 next year okay thanks a lot Sam for taking time out for us so that is uh, the expectation that although a nine month extension is most likely and Iraqi uh, delegates have already mentioned that but it should not have any impact on crude prices at least it should not push the, the crude prices up that is what our experts are really expecting uh, that should augur well for uh, I guess Indian equities if we remain in a range around sixty dollars that is the kind of scenario we see here so, uh, you know, one last question before uh, we let you go. What are some of the most interesting ideas that you are looking at in this market? So, uh, amongst our topics, one is Maruti, which has been, we have been bullish for a long time now. Then another one is actually Godrej Consumer, where, where we think the idea is getting interesting given its international business, where its Indonesian businesses are almost like turning around, which is 15% of its total. And that's where we are expecting that there would be EPS upgrades on that uh, particular stock. And then on the banking side, we have been bullish on the corporate banks for some time now, and SBI still remains one of the stocks we are trying to look at. But just a pointer that other than SBI, we don't like any of the other PSUs. So it's just SBI amongst PSUs which we like, and that's one of our topics. Anything from the private banking space? No, Anderson is definitely looking really good to us. I don't know why the stock has been falling for some time, but we think they have done a very good deal with uh, tying up with Bharat Financial. Yes. So, uh, from from a near term or maybe from a mid term perspective, it's a great stock to own. Okay, so those are a couple of picks from Santosh. Thanks a lot for joining us today and coming by to our studios. Uh, While well, switching focus back to the markets, they are at day's low once again. Nifty Bank is down to 25,400 and Nifty is also almost at day's low. 10,261 is the price that currently is scoring for Nifty. Okay, then let's shift focus and uh, talk about the FAF4 stocks of today. And to take us through the same, Yash Shapatia joins us. Yash, uh, take us through your FAF4 stocks. And good afternoon, Namni. So we kick things off with Safari Industries and this one is locked in a 20% upper circuit today, gaining the most since April of 2012. The company came out with their second quarter results yesterday post market hours and the results were quite strong. Their net profit rose three and a half times while their EBITDA number uh, rose significantly as well, almost doubled to around 8.3 crores. Margins too were significantly higher for this one and the street giving it a big thumbs up. Healthcare Global is another stock on our radar. It had surged close to 5% uh, after Goldman Sachs upgraded the rating on the stock from a hold to buy rating while also hiking the target price to 355 rupees uh, which roughly translates into a potential gain of about 25 percent from its previous day's close now a few key positives that they believe is that the see the company to grow its EBITDA at a compounded annual growth rate of 26 percent until FY20 and they also th see their margins to dilute uh, very uh, insignificantly uh, with uh, they, them increasing their capacity also island FS transportation is on our radar the stock is up about four percent after the company said that its subsidiary had won a claim worth close to 540 crores with a dispute uh, with, in a dispute with NHAI. And lastly, we have CI Industries. Now, this one too is locked in a 20% upper circuit today with volumes coming in significantly higher at seven, more than 17 times the 20-day average and has hit a fresh record high of 762.60 on the NSC. The company said that it is going to be meeting the heads of SBI, AMC, Goldman Sachs and other uh, major mutual fund heads. Thanks, Yash. It's interesting that you managed to find uh, these four big gainers in today's trade. While actually, if you look at it, 
Uh, let's look at what has happened to advanced decline and also bring in uh, the intraday movement in mid cap and small cap indices because a point, something that we have been highlighting uh, for, for a long time that the broad market is holding on, there is not much selling pressure. Uh, I'll just uh, look at some of the stocks which have slipped over last one hour or half an hour of trade. Uh, you look at Kalpataru Power, you look at MMTC, uh, also bring up Gayatri Project, look at Jindal Stainless, ADF Foods, uh, Purvankara Limited, Shrey Infrastructure. These are some of the stocks which have come under selling pressure over the last few uh, minutes, I would say, in the last half an hour of trade. Uh, and, and you saw the market breadth also kind of expanding. What has also happened with Nifty is 10,240 is the level that we see now. 10,260 was the low so far when we started the show. And that was also, interestingly, Navneet, last week's low as well. Yeah, so we have gone low. gone below the last week's low and technically speaking, that would be a negative sign. It's broken two supports today. The options data was suggesting the first support around the level of 10,270 and then it was 10,250. So that's also taken out. Clearly, these are some weak indicators. Uh, we're looking, uh, I, I, as you said, I think it's right. It's largely got to do with the expiry day because no greater cuts have been seen in the broader markets. But uh, uh, if you look at the options data, it was clearly telling you that there was huge, huge call writing right from the word go in the morning session. The 10,000 250 strikes, in fact, 250 strike on the call side has also started adding open interest. 10,300 was al already adding almost 43 lakh shares. I just want to pull up the total turnover. Uh, I know it's the expiry day, so the turnover will be on the higher side, but the FNO turnover on the National Stock Exchange, exchange has already surpassed the 13 and a half lakh crore mark. Remember, I think the all time high somewhere stands at about 15 lakh crore. We'll be watching out for that very closely. But uh, Natasha Shankar, senior uh, vice president and Head of Research at the Yes Securities joins us here in the studio. Hi, Natasha. Good afternoon and thanks a lot for coming by to our studio. Anything to worry or do you think the moves one is seeing on the downside today is largely because of the expiry day or do you see this, could, this is just the beginning of the correction in the markets? Not really anything to worry about. We do think that this is just uh, you know related to the expiry. Like we spoke last week, that we did expect this week to be largely volatile on account of expiry, and we're already seeing that happening. So not really anything to worry about. But uh, one thing that investors should remember is that December tends to see a lot of profit booking coming in from the institutional side, and starts. because of the <laughs> holiday season. So you could see this kind of you know downward pressure on markets, which actually gives you a very good time to enter the markets and buy some quality stocks. But when you are in the capital markets, the thing that you worry most about is the cost of that capital. Right. And if you look at the yields moving up almost everywhere in Germany, in US, and of course in India, we saw the 10-year moving above 7%. And then SPI decides to raise the bulk deposit rates by one percentage points in one go. It kind of tells you that probably, you know, the, the, the there is some kind of a cash crunch or cash is getting expensive. That would rather be uh, the more appropriate uh, so uh, we did a few calculations uh, the other day uh, once the bond star uh, yields had started to strengthen and uh, there are just three things that drive the market uh, valuation, the market multiples. The first is of course the return on equity, the second is cost of capital and the third is the earnings growth. Now if we keep the cost of capital even at around 12%, uh, right now it's around 10% if you're looking at the broader markets, but if you're looking at even a higher uh, cost of capital of 12%, the markets are either for factoring in about a 18% expansion on ROE or a 56% expansion in earnings over the next one, one and a half years. Now given the kind of low base that we're seeing in the TTM earnings, that seems to be something which is achievable. So I think uh, the markets have already factored in the higher level of cost of capital and even if we take that into account, we still see a lot of potential for upside. 56% expansion in earnings, what does that really mean? You mean? So it's a very simple thing. If you're looking at PE multiple, it's essentially <laughs> ROE minus G divided by ROE into VAT minus G. Now, uh, it, there are two ways of looking at it. One, that you keep ROE constant and you look at the kind of growth that is expected on earnings and ROE has been around 15%. So the kind of growth that the market seems to be factoring in, keeping that in mind and the 12% cost of capital in mind. Uh, if you solve for G, that comes up to around 56.66%, which is around 57%. 
alternatively you keep the growth constant at uh, you know twice of what is happening on the GDP side and you just keep that around 12% which is what we're seeing right now uh, which would in, in turn translate that there is an ROE expansion of about uh, 300 basis points which again is something which is plausible so both sides of things are very plausible and we do think that uh, the market should be trending up or it's not looking expensive despite factoring in a higher cost of capital over there okay Jay before we uh, let you go just two stocks I want your view on one is I want to revisit your call on jet airways and the second is uh, Jane irrigation that's the stock which has been in focus it's touched its fresh 52 week high, and we've seen good volumes coming on the cash side Yeah, Jet Airways was a short-term call. I think uh, there might be st still a little more downside to come through uh, uh, because I'm, I'm very bullish on, on crude and you, know, you spoke to your uh, crude analyst and uh, I think the possibility of crude hitting uh, you know, uh, 80 plus in, in 2018 is, is a distinct possibility. I'll, rate it, I'll give it about 75 to 80 percent probability. So, you know, I think uh, I, would, I would see that kicking in, in the medium term. In the short term, I think uh, uh, jet's downside is done. I think it might have some more upside. So there's no uh, short, no more short trade in jet at this point of time. As far as Jane irrigation is concerned, uh, you know, um, it's looking more like a short-term consolidation than uh, anything else uh, to me. So you know, it's more uh, like a, a avoid for me rather than uh, a, a any kind of uh, trading or a, a medium-term play here. So you know, that's the view on both these stocks here. Okay, look at Adani Transmission. This stock has slipped four and a half percent. In last 10-15 minutes, GETND, Future Retail, uh, SREI Infra, these are some of the stocks which are under pressure. And look at uh, PNB and SBI, both these uh, PSU majors have fallen quite a bit. And look at the index then, Nifty below 10,220 now, approaching 10,200 levels. I think 10,300 plus uh, is the level that we saw when we started this 10, show, which means... Uh, yeah. In last one hour of trade, uh, Nifty has lost almost 90 points, close to 100 now. Well, clearly, I think uh, there's a lot of selling pressure. You know what this to me looks like? Probably, uh, I thought there were a lot of shots in the system which could, which would come to cover in the last hour of trade. Maybe that would have triggered the short covering rally, but looks like the shots are being moved to the December contract now. So if you could just pull up the Nifty rollovers and see where they stand currently, because remember the rollovers. Uh, were on the higher side in the last two to three trading sessions, specifically for Nifty and also the market wide. So, okay, it's about 55. Uh, we'll uh, check the rollovers again by the end of the session and see how they stack up as compared uh, to the last series or not. But uh, uh, Natasha, T stocks in a weak market like today, today's also, we've seen them going up. And this is not a pocket that we talk about every day. But I don't know, a lot of analysts are now of the view that the cycle has actually turned after the last two, three years when the prices were not going up. Do you, do you concur? Would you put uh, advise people to put, put their money into the T stocks? We just have a broad view over there okay. and not really a stock specific view over there. But we do think that uh, you know the prices should not have stayed down for so long. And uh, given that they've been down for almost two to three yeah. years, uh, this is the time for the prices to start improving, which is what the markets seem to be factoring in. Uh, if you're looking at the these stocks, but again, that's not an area that we're covering ad actively as of now. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Sachitanel, some of the uh, power stocks are under pressure. We, I just mentioned Adani Transmission. You also look at GETND, which is a related stock in that sense. You also have REC or Rural Electrification, which has slipped by three percent, lost one one and a half percent in last few minutes. Actually, uh, what's your view on these stocks? Do you see a trade uh, either on long or the short side? Well, honestly, uh, REC has been our short candidate, and we have been trading on the short side. But since it had, you know, just uh, you know, uh, retested the uh, intermediate support, so we have advised to book profits. But overall, you know, the, the trend. Uh, even from here on looks negative so probably a breach below say 152 on a sustained basis and we may see this particular stock you know heading towards say 145 kind of a level so purely uh, based on the trend analysis you know the trend still looks Go weak the agreement uh, can we just go across and listen to what minister is saying will tell us come the first quarter second quarter next year now we've just had the television journalist join us here and obviously huge interest in the top table. Um, Mr. Alfala, the president of the conference, is of course sitting there and um, everybody wants to, to get, I suppose, a, a double comment from him because they want...
Okay, so that's it. Uh, some of the important statements that I could pick up uh, uh, from the Saudi minister was that market, uh, that uh, the inventories have not corrected to the comfortable level. So there is, there could be a need uh, to extend the cut. Oil output caps proposed by several countries and uh, that is being discussed in today's meet. Iraq says there is an in principle agreement reached uh, on an extension by at least nine months. And Iran also says that uh, a price range of 60 to 65 is favorable. Let's go back to the network and see what that is. They will continue to monitor the market. I don't expect in the next couple of quarters anything to uh, to, to change uh, the course that that we're in. So, so we're probably going to uh, adopt a decision that allows us to continue the process that has worked so well in 2017 and allow us to meet the target that we put for ourselves uh, all along a year ago, which is to to bring inventories down to their normal so how, level. Is it, is it is it to shell, shell, is especially in China, sir. Are you worried about that, sir? Is an exit strategy going to be part of the conversation at all? What happens beyond a nine months extension? I think it's premature to talk about an exit. I think we all know that when it's time to adjust to normal production levels, we will need to do it gently, and we will need to do it in a very thoughtful and, and considered way, and we will do it in consultation uh, amongst uh, the participating countries, and those countries with spare capacity will gradually bring back their production to meet market demand and ensure that we don't uh, unnecessarily draw down inventories to uh, to a tight level that is not healthy for the market. Some of the ministers are very concerned about market share, especially in China. Very strongly about the compliance. Uh, we're extremely, we're extremely satisfied with uh, with the conformity levels that we have. Okay, so that's the view coming in from uh, the oil minister of Saudi Arabia. All eyes on OPEC and we expect that the final decision will be shared with, with media by around 9.30 or 10 p.m. late evening. So we'll keep track of that. But it's time to take a look at uh, what are the dealing rooms really recommending at this point. Is there a panic, uh, Yatin? Uh, how is the scenario now? We are approaching 10,200 on Nifty. Uh, clearly, Pradeep, the expiry has not that been great. Uh, in fact, we are uh, almost at the day's low. Uh, but look at this stock, Fortis, uh, and uh, the stock is at the day's high. So despite weak market conditions, uh, this is one stock which is inching at the day's high. And domestic funds are said to be buyers here. Of course, uh, there is uh, some buzz in the market rela uh, relating to some transaction that can happen in Fortis. Uh, we have been hearing that for long. So Fortis is one stock uh, that, that dealers are positive on. PNB, that is one stock in the banking space wherein dealers are expecting some downside. So they are recommending a STB. Uh, based on FNO uh, trends and finally watch out for GHCL that stock has corrected uh, of course uh, we had uh, mutual funds which had bought uh, shares uh, from the promoters but dealers indicate that HNIs are even buyers at these levels uh, and at lower levels accumulation is seen as far as this mid cap counter is concerned Okay, Yatin, thanks a lot for bringing that dealing room check for us. But let's move on. Reliance Communications is not the only Anil Ambani Group company that's having a tough time with its lenders. IFCI has also filed an insolvency application against Reliance Naval and Engineering. Sajit Manga joins in with more details. Sachin, how, uh, so, pardon me, Sajit, how big is this loan? And I, I've, I've been tracking Reliance Naval, which is also in the futures and options market. In the last two days, it's corrected really sharply. So what we understand is that IFCI has approached uh, the NCLT Ahmedabad with respect to a loan uh, which was lent to its uh, subsidiary which is Alliance Marine and Offshore Limited. Uh, this loan in amount is around 150 crores odd. Uh, it's not relating to the parent but to a subsidiary uh, where, uh, which has it seems has defaulted on payment of loan. Remember uh, uh, and this happened somewhere around November mid uh, where, uh, where the filing was done. The, uh, the entire uh, case has not been admitted with NCLT still under admission uh, but what we understand is that uh, IFCI is uh, trying to seek uh, uh, some kind of uh, you know resolution with respect to uh, recovery of that loan to the subsidiary uh, arm uh, we haven't heard from Reliance Naval uh, and and engineering uh, though we expect this statement which is expected from the company soon uh, and IFCI was also not reachable uh, to uh, to give its comment uh, as, as of now 
Okay, thanks, Ajit, for the details. As Ajit mentioned, that it's possible that IFCI and Reliance Neville will find some way out and not really go for bankruptcy, but stocks down as of now by around 2%. Uh, it has corrected quite a bit, as Navneet was just mentioning over the last few sessions as well. Uh, Natasha, do you track uh, Reliance Neville? You have a view on this development? Not really. We don't track any one of the ADAC group stocks except for Reliance Capital, actually. What about, about the new view? one, Reliance Nippon? Uh, we cannot really comment on that. We will need managers okay. there. Okay, but what's your view on Reliance Capital? It's corrected quite a bit. Are you buying now? No, not yet. Not we yet. think that uh, there could be more correction due uh, largely on account of the other companies and the group companies, you know, Reliance Naval being one of them and Reliance Communications being uh, the larger part of it because a lot of shares of Reliance Capital are pledged against the loan of Reliance Communication which put, keeps the downward pressure. But yes, the listing of its subsidiaries and the listing of its uh, holding companies, uh, group companies, I'm sorry, is something which is a major value unlocking event which is happening with them. But uh, till such time as these uh, prices stabilize, we would prefer to stay away from it. Okay, that's the view on Reliance Capital. The counter is down almost 2%. Uh, let's go back to Sachitanand. He was giving us views on uh, some stocks. Sachitanand, sorry uh, to interrupt you before. Uh, uh, you can go on with the stock you were talking about. And also, Power I want rights. your... Which one? Power stocks, I guess. All right, Power stocks, uh, Sachitanand. Yes, as uh, we were discussing, you know, uh, on the short side, we have been recommending REC. But, you know, the stock is now close to its uh, immediate support zone and a, a, a firm closing below 152 is something which will be required to, you know, uh, continue this particular momentum towards, say, 147, 145 levels. So, overall, uh, from the pack, I think REC looks like a better pick and, uh, you know, uh, from a trend perspective, we are comfortable sensing that uh, this particular weakness may continue towards 145 levels uh, in the uh, coming trading sessions. So that's the call on REC, but I'll keep going back to OPEC because uh, there are some fresh developments where one, what, what I could read on tickers is that uh, real, uh, that Russia has also agreed to join into uh, the production cut. That is one quote coming from, uh, from, from a delegate and also uh, Saudi Arabia has mentioned that they would like to review the situation before third quarter, which definitely means by June 28. So, uh, Although there is an extension by nine months, but looks like Navneet is coming with some riders that do the situation in between and, and there could be some decision uh, to alter it. So they, they'll keep watch because maybe uh, oil prices have already gained uh, to the extent they, they wanted it to gain. <laughs> that's fine. That's right. And uh, we'll keep tracking uh, those uh, developments for you with uh, regard uh, to that meeting of OPEC and non-OPEC countries which takes place in Vienna today. But 10 minutes to go for markets to close such uh, What are your top trading strategies? Any individual stocks where you would like to take any sort of position either in the long or the short side? Well, as I said, uh, the bias for us on the market uh, remains uh, clearly negative and uh, Kotak Mahindra Bank, uh, after a long time, you know, looks uh, weak. So probably keeping a stop loss somewhere close to 1,020 fresh uh, short positions can be initiated uh, in the December future, close to say 1,005, 1,002 kind of a zone. And uh, we may see uh, this particular downtick getting con continued right up to 970 levels. So probably not just from a uh, HTBT kind of a uh, perspective, but overall I think uh, for the next couple of weeks, uh, we may see this particular stock under pressure and stop loss should be maintained at around 1,020. Okay, so that's the, that's the trading strategy uh, coming in at this point. Uh, you know, looking at uh, this expiry, we are also uh, on the last day of this month. Today's closing would really be interesting. And if you look at the uh, nifty levels on last expiry, I think we closed at 10,340, 45, Four, something, 40, 44. Yeah, around 344 levels. And I think... Uh, uh, we've not moved beyond that range which one saw even in the last series. The December series is also is, uh, indicating the same sort of uh, range that one can look at. But clearly, uh, we did scale to new year highs in this series for both Nifty as well as Bank Nifty. And Bank Nifty actually outperformed. We started Bank Nifty this series around 25,000 and we moved very closer to the 26,000 mark which, Nifty, uh, which Bank Nifty couldn't touch. But I think we've given up most of its gains. And today's fall is actually led by uh, the correction that one has seen in the banking stocks. Just pull up the Nifty PSU banking index. That's your major sectoral loser for the day. Uh, Natasha, in the PSU banking space, well, we did see the stocks moving up after that news of 
you know, recapitalization came about. But I think most of the stocks are giving up the gains that, you know, we saw just after that announcement. Uh, do you think there is any more steam left in the PSU banking space or one should still bear on the private side? So we prefer the private players uh, over the PSU players and uh, within the PSU space we still maintain that if any stock could be looked at would be SKI. Uh, of course that is the country's largest bank uh, and uh, they've done a good job of trying to clean up their books. Now given that fact that we do think that the pain would continue for another two to three quarters on the asset quality side but we think that uh, SBI is probably uh, best place to try and uh, ride out any kind of uh, gain or rally on the PSU banking space. We are pretty much neutral on the rest of the pack. Mm -hmm. Well, tomorrow we'll also uh, start getting the auto sales numbers and the expectation that we have shared so far, you know, double digit or even 20% plus kind of a growth expected from various companies. Although uh, analysts have mentioned that this could be because of the lower base effect since last time we had demonetization. Right. Uh, how would you really read these numbers then and what's, what's your view uh, and reaction on these numbers? So we think uh, Maruti should be the biggest gainer over there because we do expect market shares to improve for uh, Maruti uh, on the back of better traction seen uh, for some of their models, especially the higher end Nexa models. Uh, there's been a, lo a lot of healthy traction coming in on that side. And that would help in uh, better numbers uh, both on the sales side as well as on the profitability side for Maruti. That's the one that remains our top pick over there. Hmm. Which are the pockets you know, that you would look at uh, or rather you would advise our viewers to look at at, at the time when markets are correcting? Uh, we've seen correction coming in, so let's say the, you don't like the PSU banking stocks but overall there has been a correction which has come about. So any specific pocket that you would advise to buy at these lower levels? So I think uh, the areas where we still continue to remain positive on and where we've been recommending clients and investors to pick up stocks uh, on every day. Uh, one is everything related to consumption, uh, be it autos, be it consumer durable, be it uh, retail. Uh, the second area which we are positive on is the infrastructure space, uh, particularly on the road uh, developer space. And uh, the third one uh, would, uh, large, would largely be the housing uh, space, with, be it you know, directly related to housing or indirectly through house, housing finance or through building materials. So those were the areas. So you said retail. Would you like to buy into future retail now after correction? Oh yes, we, that's a stock which is we one of our top We spoke to her <laughs> last time when she had come. I think the news came so, about that day. Right, so I think no, uh, we still can continue to... Since then. It has corrected a bit since then, but uh, if you're looking at the longer term growth, uh, we still continue to remain positive on it. Okay, so those were a couple of pockets uh, which Natasha just highlighted that one can look to buy at these levels. Let's just pull up the intraday chart of JSW Energy. I think that's uh, been a little bit strong compared to the other stocks today. There you go. It's almost a day's high, 3.3% higher at levels of 84, Sachdanan. Uh, JSW, would you recommend to initiate any sort of fresh long positions here? Well, on the daily scale, the pattern looks promising. In fact, uh, it's a rising three kind of a formation. In fact, uh, you know, the pattern needs a confirmation above 85 levels. So probably one should wait for a closing or a trade in, uh, in the coming sessions above 85. A stop loss can be placed, uh, you know, once that particular level is achieved at around 83. And some trading momentum can be participated on the long side. But, uh, you know, clearly, uh, you know, it has to be a level-based trade and, uh, you know, 85 uh, would be a level to watch out in the coming session so once we have a closing or a trade above 85 then probably this particular pattern gets activated and we may see uh, the follow through move then well surprising to see high beta counters like dlf in a weak market like today have managed to sustain their gains dlf is also trading with gains of about over two uh, percent quickly such uh, view on dlf on the charts Well, uh, the way uh, the stock has been uh, performing, I think there is still slight room on the upside. Uh, f just purely from a trading perspective, we are expecting around 241 kind of a zone. So, you know, uh, if one, per uh, if any person is holding this particular counter on the long side, they should hold on to the counter for a price target around 241, on uh, which can be achieved in the next couple of days itself. 240 is the near-term target which Sachdanan has on DLF. But let's look at the market closing. It's been a very, very weak day on the last day of the November series, last trading day for this month uh, as well. Let's go across to Pradeep to find out how exactly the market closing is panning out. Pradeep. It's a day of, it's a day of breakdowns, breakdowns, I would say. I would say, I would say, I would say because 
2,220 now. We thought 10,350 was a decent support level for markets. It has completely been taken, and thereafter we have seen a sharp cut. Nifty Bank also uh, below 25,500 marks. So again, uh, I think uh, technical traders will have reasons to worry about. Mid cap and small cap will not that deeper cuts. If you look at the BSE small cap index, it continues to be in positive, interestingly, uh, but still some sort of pressure, uh, especially in the second half of the day. And the volume started building and some of these discounters uh, that have corrected. So that could be a, a cause for concern. But let's look at which are the key contributors so far as the index is concerned. And on the higher side, you have one, two, three, four. Out of 30 Sensex stocks, only four are closing in green, remaining 26 in red. LNT tops the chart along with Bajaj Auto, NTPC and Dr. Red D's. Look at some of the heavyweights. HUL down half a percent. TCS down almost a percent. ONGC, Maruti down close to a percent. ITC close to a percent. HDFC and HDFC Bank have lost between 1% and HDFC is down, uh, in fact, uh, close to 2%. Over the last two or three sessions, the stock has corrected more than 5%, uh, I would uh, think. ICICI Bank, another key loser, but RIL right at the bottom, heavyweight, must have contributed maximum to the losses today. Amnit. They clearly, the broader markets outperformed the benchmark indices and there were a couple of uh, pockets or rather individual stocks which stood out. So let me start off with TRF. The stock has, was strong throughout the session. Today, as you can see too, it was locked in upper circuit with gains of almost 20%. That's TRF, closed at levels of 275. Uh, Island FS Investment, we usually don't talk about this counter much. Look at that. It uh, gained almost 13.5% and finally closed at levels of uh, 28. There were two stocks uh, since the morning session which were gaining. One of them was MT Educare and Mukta Art. So despite in a weak market also, they sustained their gains. MT Educare closed the day with gains of 12.5% and Mukta Art was also pretty active. That closed with gains of almost 12.5%. Couple of themes which have been working uh, out in the last, uh, in the recent past. So one of them is T-Stock. So you saw stocks like McLeod Russell, Harrison Malayalam. I'm just highlighting two stocks here, but the entire pocket was up today. McLeod up 7% and Harrison up almost 10%. Gen Irrigation, that's the FNO counter, which touched fresh 52-week high, but the action was actually on the cash side today. They were The stock rallied on account of very high volumes that one saw, so watch out for the delivery data as well out here. Jewelry stocks saw a bit of profit booking coming about, so TBS uh, was down almost 10%, and Purvankra and Shrey Infra, these are the counters which were rallying, so what you saw today was the profit booking coming in for stocks like Purvankra and as well as Shrey Infra, which closed almost most at day's low with cuts of six and a half percent Pradeep. Well, let's look at how the market is finally closing and 10,226 odd levels on Nifty and 25,332 on Nifty Bank. Uh, let's look at some of the contributors, RIL, ICICI Bank, HDFC, HDFC Bank. Now, this is very significant. Look at the top three banking majors uh, giving up their gains. So, have traders really uh, given up hopes that were built by the Moody's upgrade. If you look at this entire series, we saw a big leg up because of that upgrade coming in from Moody's markets uh, uh, move back to the higher levels and we thought we'll hit the new highs that we didn't. And now when we are correcting, it's the banking sector which is once again leading. If you remember it, you know, uh, on the very next day of the upgrade, what we saw, Nifty Bank had hit the new highs and that was led by these names only. Uh, well, it looks like, you know, uh, on the positive side, you have a few names like Gale. Uh, well, gas segment has been doing well. You have Eibulls Housing, Bharti Airtel, but none, none of the uh, heavyweights that could really drive the markets up. Let's look at the overall picture. And this is the advanced decline ratio. Uh, we had almost come to a 50-50 level uh, at around 2 o'clock. But after that, the fresh selling pressure came in. Nifty gave up almost 90 points uh, in, in last hour or hour and a half. And look at uh, this picture now. This is finally probably probably the worst scenario that we have seen. In the morning, I remember we had almost 80% stocks in red, but there were a few gainers. But this is uh, the worst picture that we have seen uh, since morning today. Uh, you have SPI down 2.5% now, RIL down 2.5% now. These are some of the heavyweights that have pulled the markets down. You also have Wipro here. 
uh, very few uh, gainers actually. So on the negative side, you have almost all, all the sectors contributing. There is a cross the board selling or a, a basket kind of a selling. So view is really on the index uh, rather than on any individual uh, sector, so to say, that we can, we can uh, definitely uh, infer from looking at this picture. But there is some interest in oil and gas stocks. You can see Gale, HPCL, IOC is also not doing badly. So looks like markets are probably uh, anticipating some kind of correction in crude oil. Crude has already discounted uh, uh, you know, the outcome of OPEC meeting. And if there are riders, ifs and buts, with the extension, there could be some correction out there. So oil stocks will definitely remain in focus. Sachidanand, uh, tomorrow morning when we come back, we'll have uh, the definite picture of what have the opaque and non-opaque countries uh, agreed upon and we'd also uh, we would have seen the uh, global oil markets reacting to it if you look at the charts of some of the oil and gas heavyweights is there any interesting pattern any trade that you could spot well uh, 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 if you look at uh, ongc itself i think uh, the stock has been uh, you know under pressure for last couple of weeks but if you look at uh, the previous uh, week itself, you know, it has been consolidating somewhere close to 180, uh, 182 band and it has really not been uh, participating in this particular fall. So probably, uh, you know, it is waiting, uh, waiting for a particular trigger. So purely from a price perspective, you know, in case uh, if there's something positive which comes out, 185 is the level to watch out. And uh, once this particular level is triggered, we may see a sharp rebound towards say 205 204 kind of a zone on the lower side uh, you know a decisive breach below 175 from here on and you know the stock can just tumble down towards 160 so probably you know one should be a level based trader in this particular stock and watch out for uh, the developments uh, that are happening uh, uh, in the coming trading sessions from a level perspective 185 on the higher side uh, a trigger uh, for a move towards 204 205 and on the lower side, 175 is the critical support. All right, Sachitanan, thank you very much for joining us today and taking us through your uh, technical ideas. I just want to pull up the total turnover for today. Remember, today was the expiry day, but as we indicated during the show as well, the turnover was looking on the higher side. So overall recorded turnover, this 15.5 lakh crore, which I believe is almost at all-time high, and NSCF and O turnover just little shy of the 15 lakh crore. And I remember last time 15 lakh crore turnover was seen for the September series, so the turnover was definitely on the higher side, telling you the correction that one saw today was an account of higher participation as well. Well, Natasha, before you go, closing thoughts from your side. You want to share any investment ideas with our viewers? So I think uh, we're still maintaining the same investment ideas that we discussed earlier and I think uh, post the correction that we saw today, especially in uh, future retail, it looks all the more attractive. Uh, so retail, consumer durables, auto stocks, those are the ones that we continue to remain positive on. Okay, Natasha, thanks a lot for joining Thank us you. today in our studio. Well, it's time for us to slip into a short break on Countdown. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back with more on the other side. Are we live? Welcome to programming that's insightful, authoritative and at your fingertips. Bringing news alive. So immersive, so new, and so addictive, you will want it no other way. The Bloomberg Terminal, accessed only by over 325,000 marquee investors across the world. Until now.
Welcome back. Uh, let's look at how the markets did today. And this was probably, uh, you know, one of the most volatile expiries we have seen of late. Although in the morning there was a gap down and we thought markets will try and recover. They did, did try to recover from lower levels. But especially in the last hour or hour and a half, uh, selling started once again. And if you look at the movement in Nifty or even Bank Nifty, the chart on the screen is probably telling you how the markets really moved. In last hour of trade, even market breadth expanded. Uh, a, a bit uh, and there were more losers than gainers what what would uh, be worrying really is that in uh, till about two o'clock we didn't have a much of a selling pressure that was seen in terms of uh, selling with heavy volumes but if you look at the last hour of trade several stocks uh, like i would say future retail adani transmission reliance infra UPL, which are some of the liquid mid-cap stocks, they came under pressure. Uh, so there was definitely some kind of liquidation uh, that emerged towards the end of the day. If you talk about the large caps that were driving the markets uh, today, SBI lost around 2 to 2.5% uh, because they decided to raise the, uh, the bulk deposit rates. But uh, you know, if you look at the other uh, private sector banks, they also corrected. So it doesn't look like that it was a news-driven move in this PI rather than uh, it was moving along with the index. Being a heavyweight, there was significant selling pressure at uh, the counter. You also had some of the heavyweights like RIL participating. So uh, this, I think this expiry has definitely given us uh, a lot to worry about. Yeah, lots to ponder on. What was the reason? We, we'll also be getting the quarter three GDP numbers in the evening. So let's see whether there were jitters just ahead of that GDP numbers. But uh, let's switch focus and also have a look at the European markets. I guess it's been a mixed day of trade there. Uh, Brie Taylor joins us from uh, the studios in London to take us through the action on the European indices. Hi, Brie. Hello, good morning. So most European indexes are in the green right now. The stock 600 is being led higher by telecom and utility companies. And European tech shares are a little changed after we saw a slide in the U.S. tech companies yesterday. The FANGs, also known as Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, all closed down, dragging down the major benchmark indexes in the U.S. And it seems that investors are rotating their trades out of tech stocks and into more defensive shares. Now, what's going on? The U.S. sell-off was probably thanks to the highly anticipated tax bill. Now let's turn back to what's going on here in Europe. A big corporate story this morning is Credit Suisse. The Swiss bank plans to return half its net income to shareholders through buybacks or special dividends. And we continue to watch sterling as the UK and the EU work on a compromise on the Irish border that will allow a breakthrough in the Brexit talks. At one point, we saw the pound at the highest, hit the highest level in two months. And lastly, today is, of course, the highly anticipated meeting of oil producers in Vienna. We are seeing oil prices rebounding as OPEC and Russia are ready to extend their oil production cuts until the end of next year. So that's what we're watching here in Europe. Back to you. Thanks, Bree, now for the update. Have a nice day. Moving on to uh, a big voice from local markets. Uh, identifying multi-bagger ideas like these or bottom-up stock picking is, is what uh, Samit Vartak of Sage One Investment Advisors uh, relies on uh, in a converse conversation with Neera Shah in our special series, Alpha Moguls. Vartak says... Uh, that there are interesting sectors uh, that he's picking up and he, where he believes into the stories and he shared all his ideas in this special conversation. Let's listen in uh, to a chunk of that uh, interview. Now, what we look for in our portfolio is that we look for minimum 25% kind of a earnings growth. And it's not that easy to find in a, you know, in an economy which is growing nominally at, in single digits. Sure. Right, so you need to find global themes where there is structurally, you know, big changes happening across the globe. Now you look at specialty chemical business, majority of it which was controlled by China. Now, what's happening in China is, I mean, everyone is aware of uh, the pollution control issues, yeah, but I think the, the second issue is the growth they achieved, you know, was not based on profitability. You know, they just went for volumes. And because of which their debt level, the same thing which is happening at the country level, was happening even at the company level. Now you can't just sustain that for long because you can produce volume, then you have to dump it at whatever you know below cost. 
and that's where the the, the debt level go, goes up now this government is forcing these companies to first of all make pollution you know take that into order and also uh, you know go for profitable growth rather than just volume growth you know employment was the main focus then i don't think is the case now now they want to make it more sustainable if that's the case their pricing has to go up you know mainly because of pollution solution yeah. that they will have to fi find at the same time if they can't take debt they have to finance it internally sure. their prices have to go up and that's where india has become a much level playing field you got to find niches in there you know you can't just go across specialty chemicals because there are certain niche where india is probably just 2 or 3% of the market whereas china is 70 75% so that's where the growth will happen yes and lot of these chemicals are generally approved you know by the customers so what happens is that if certain plant shuts down in china and uh, customer doesn't get it they can't just switch to some other plant or a country because the approval process itself takes 4 to 6 months and if that is the case irrespective of what the cost is they would want to develop a second source and india is that second source okay. so even if india has to sell <coughs> higher price they're completely fine because they need an assured source so where if something goes wrong at least they have approved plants where they can uh, so what's this niche area and specialty chemicals i mean is there a specific area that an indian company might be supplying to i mean would it be fluorochemicals there are multiple there are cetera. there are multiple of those so you, uh, um, so uh, you know there are companies in rubber chemicals uh, you know there are uh, companies in you know niche specialty ke chemicals uh, but you got to be careful that these you know the growth that is coming through sure. is not just a short term blip just right. because a couple of plants are shutting down you got to make sure that the company you know who is taking advantage of that it has inherent strength and it has inherent com competitive advantage you know mm -hmm. they are not just benefiting because of you know some kind of anti dumping duty which is you know which can be short term you know or no which you, it may go away sure. so i think you if you focus on those they are available at pretty reasonable prices okay uh, you get uh, 20 25% kind of a growth and that's a good idea to be in okay so we have 2 minutes on the show yes. left samit yes. so i just want to quickly take 1 minute for the other themes and if you can run through auto angs if you believe there's a particular pocket within auto angs which will do well 30 seconds for this i i feel auto angs is uh, you got to focus on the low so two wheeler and the four wheeler segment the four wheeler lower end of the uh, prices and also the ones which are globally oriented mm -hmm. i think in unemployment is a big issue in india if india has to address that they will have to make sure that more and more manufacturing happens through india they will have to make india as a export oriented market and there are companies who are globally the most competitive i think they will take advantage of that all right moving on continuing with our focus on mid cap companies on the sidelines of motilal oswal's mid cap conference let's now welcome in arun bagadia executive director at mayur unicotis and yatin mota joins in on the conversation as well uh, thanks for that uh, navneet uh, sir uh, first question uh, really uh, would be about uh, gst as well as the bs4 uh, transition how really uh, you know uh, has uh, Uh, the overall uh, uh, business uh, shaping up uh, for uh, you at uh, you know my unicotus because uh, in general we have seen uh, demand fluctuate uh, from passenger vehicles to commercial vehicles gst has actually helped us in the growth of the organization uh, it has a positive in, uh, impact on the company and we see a growth uh, if you see our quarter to results we have registered a 14 we have registered a 14 to 15% growth uh, uh, in the quarter 2 uh, which was like 8 to 9% in the quarter 1 uh, so uh, definitely there is a huge demand in the automotive segment the automotive replacement market has given us more than 40 to 45% growth uh, in quarter 2 and the footwear segment is also back on track which has given us 4 to 5% growth this quarter <laughs> Uh, for your uh, artificial uh, leather products uh, we have uh, uh, you know uh, clients like maruti uh, doing uh, very well uh, so in terms of outlook uh, for the domestic market uh, uh, how do you see the overall uh, uh, thing shape up and also if you could tell us first about the uh, export markets as well there are two segments uh, we are exporting to usa so we see a 10 to 15% growth in the automotive usa market 
we are also talking in the European market for which we have had a second uh, audit uh, just a few months back and we expect the first lot of orders to come uh, uh, in the quarter nine uh, quarter sorry uh, the third quarter of the next financial year and uh, what about the export uh, uh, you know you spoke about the export markets uh, what about the domestic markets how do you see that uh, shaping up especially for clients like maruti one of our main driver for growth has been maruti so maruti there are two segments one is the oem segment and second is the replacement market uh, by their uh, subsidiary unit which is called maruti genuine accessories so we have seen a very big growth uh, in the mg division of maruti so we are seeing a growth of 35 to 40 percent growth uh, in the quarter two for maruti genuine accessories Overall, we see a 15 to 16 percent growth in the automotive sector. We have tapped in new programs from Tata's and Mahindra's also. So we definitely expect a 15 to 16 percent growth in the automotive segment. Uh, so talking about your margins, uh, you know, how do you uh, see that shaping up moving forward? Because as uh, volumes improve, do you see uh, the margin uh, inching up over the 25 percent uh, mark? Do you think? Uh, from here on, we could see some improvement in realizations and uh, improvement, in, improvement in margins. This is something very difficult to say. Uh, definitely, we are, see our main purpose is to run the company very efficiently. Seeing the current trend, we are hopeful that the margin should remain uh, at the same levels. Uh, we don't see any uh, uh, reason why the margin should go down at the current levels. Okay, and, and as you uh, get into value-added products and uh, new uh, business lines, uh, how do you see uh, your overall uh, realizations sh uh, shape up? And do you think with improvement in realizations, especially from the export markets, uh, we could see substantial uh, improvement in your operating performance and margins? Uh, export definitely is giving us a better realization compared to the domestic sales. So we are trying a lot to increase, to increase our footprint in the global market. Uh, both in terms of the OEM business and in terms of uh, the general exports that we are doing. So we expect a good 15 to 16 percent growth in the automotive and the general export market. Uh, in terms of domestic, we are trying to enter into the detail business, which uh, will give us uh, 3 to 4 percent extra margin on our uh, uh, overall uh, increase, which will give 3 to, percent, uh, 3 to 4 percent overall increase in the margins. Uh, definitely we are trying to improve on our internal efficiencies also and we have gone into backward integration of fabric plant which has uh, improved our margins a lot. Okay, so that was the management of uh, Mayur Unicoters, uh, confident of maintaining the EBITDA margins at current levels, probably export will improve their realizations uh, overall uh, moving forward. Uh, but uh, with that, uh, Navneet uh, and Pradeep, uh, if you could have uh, some closing market comments. Well, thanks, uh, Nitin, for all these uh, updates and a conversation with Mayur Unicotus Management. Moving on to the macro data release today. How has been the sales performance after the GST and BS4 related transactions? All eyes would be on that, and we'll we'll see what kind of uh, numbers to really get from there. But uh, that we would come to know only by tomorrow when auto companies start to giving out numbers. But more important data release today is going to be the fiscal deficit number and also the GDP numbers. So fiscal deficit data that has already come, it crossed 96.1% of the full year targets in October. The gap between government's revenue and spending stood at 5.25 lakh crores in the April to October period so far. Uh, the budgeted target for the calendar year 18 is 5 lakh 70, uh, 47 thousand crores. Uh, meanwhile, we are watching out for the GDP growth data as well, and that data will be released in less than two hours from now. And uh, the broad consensus is that the Indian economy may have picked up pace once again in second quarter. Ira Dugal is standing by with more details on that. Over to you, Ira. Right, I think uh, the second quarter GDP numbers are uh, all important, as you said, in trying to understand how quickly and how well the Indian economy is recovering from two shocks, that's demonetization and GD, uh, GST. Uh, the expectation is that on gross value added, you would get a growth of about 6.2%. That's compared to last quarter's 5.6%. Uh, the high on those expectations is at 6.8%. The low is at 5.7%. Uh, just to make the point that there's still a wide sort of variation in the expectations uh, from the Indian economy and how 
how quickly it recovers. Gross domestic product, a little bit more commonly tracked there. The median expectation is 6.4% uh, compared to last quarter's 5.7%. Uh, important to watch sectors, in particular, the sectors that had taken the brunt of uh, the demonetization impact. So we're just putting three out of the eight over here for you to uh, try and see uh, what those sectors do. Construction dipped very sharply in the fourth quarter of last year and then continued to remain subdued in the first quarter. So important to watch uh, what happens to construction. Not everybody is clear that the real estate sector has recovered. Uh, so maybe you'll see a flattish number on construction even in this quarter. Financial services again had taken a dip in fourth quarter, remained subdued in the first quarter. Uh, loan growth still remains quite weak, so not sure how much and to what extent financial services will recover, but it could because there are various other components that go into it as well. Uh, manufacturing that's been weak. 1.2% uh, is what you got in the first quarter. Uh, there's a lot of confusion on what will happen to the manufacturing segment. We know that GST is continuing to play out in the unorganized sector, uh, but we don't know how much of that gets captured uh, in this quarter's data uh, in terms of the manufacturing sector. So sectorally, those three plus public administration, which is linked to government spending, uh, should be important to watch out for. Uh, on the expenditure side, the three main components, as always, uh, will be uh, gross fixed capital formation, private consumption, and government consumption. Uh, you've had gross fixed capital formation be very weak. Slight pickup came in in the first quarter of uh, fiscal 18. Will that continue? That's important to watch. Some people are saying that you will continue to see a very steady and slow grind up in fixed capital formation, part of it due to base, part of it due to some pickup in activity, not huge capex, but just some activity. Uh, so you could see that uh, go up perhaps a little bit. You've had uh, Private consumption, which has been steady, no reason to believe there'll be a dramatic change there. Government consumption came off last quarter in terms of growth, year-on-year -year growth. Uh, so watch that very closely as well, because the strained government finances that you were talking about uh, means that perhaps there could be some pullback. Uh, last word on uh, exports. Uh, there has been a healthy debate on whether exports are the reason you're seeing uh, a slowdown in the GDP headline numbers. And JP Morgan and Sajid Chinoy, JP Morgan, have been making that point, looking at the last cycle of economic growth and how well exports were doing in that cycle and how poorly exports are doing in this cycle. Uh, some people, though, some economists believe that you shouldn't look just at exports but at net exports. And if you look at it in that context, then perhaps uh, that uh, number is not uh, translating into a huge amount of weakness to the GDP. But it does have a bearing on the manufacturing sector as well. 5.30ish uh, or so is when we get the numbers. Uh, we'll get you those for sure. All right, Ira, thanks a lot for bringing in all those details. So do keep an eye on GDP numbers, which come out at 5.30. Let's move on. India accounts for more than 10% of global leather production, with factories starting from Kanpur in the north all the way down to Kolkata. While most of them have been around for centuries now, they are yet to make the transition to the formal economy. Bloomberg Quinn's Purva Chitnas traveled to Kanpur only to find out that the leather industry has to deal with the whole host of factors that's hitting them in the fast succession. Let's listen in. Before cow vigilantes cracked down on slaughterhouses, tanneries were shut to curb pollution, the cash purge hurt demand, and the new nationwide tax mandated 36 filings a year. Mohammad Sharif's tannery in suburban Kanpur was thriving. शुरुआत में और अब में बहुत फर्क है पहले हर चीज थोड़ी सी आसानी से मिल जाया करती थी availability थी अब जो है बहुत महंगा भी हो गया है किसकी availability raw material की availability chemical की और जो competition था वो भी कम था तो अब जो है थोड़ा competition भी बढ़ गया है और जो norms हैं सरकारी Taking advantage of the situation, countries like Vietnam, Bangladesh and China have flooded the market with cheaper leather, making Indian exports uncompetitive. Industry is in a difficult situation. It is a very difficult time for the industry. We are having a lot of competition from different countries. From last three years, we have a negative uh, export growth. Exports have gone down by about 15 to 20 percent. Now, we want more orders, but part of that business has already shifted to China, to Bangladesh, to Vietnam. Growth news is that the factories will be removed, the work will be closed, the shifting will be closed. So, the order that the foreigners come to the order, the order will be closed on the order. The order will be closed on the order. The order will be closed on the order, the government will be closed on the order. 
Since leather units sourced raw skins from abattoirs, it has hurt supply. Fear of beef vigilantes has hurt the cattle trade. There has been a problem in India about the, about the slaughtering of uh, the cattle hides. Slaughtering was slowed down considerably. Less slaughtering means less raw hides. And if we need more raw hide than what they're slaughtering every day, that means that automatically their prices go up. It's about uh, 10 to 15 percent higher. Apart from the decrease in supply of raw materials, the industry has also been impacted by the double whammy of strict pollution control norms and GST. There are about 25 small shoe shops here in the by lane of Kanpur. But the retailers here are not really happy because the implementation of GST has slowed down their business. इससे 40 रुपए से 50 रुपए डिफरेंस आया हम लोग के पैर में तो जीएसटी की जांच से थोड़ा लेदर शॉर्ट टेस्ट कर रहा तो मार्केट में लोगों ने रेट बढ़ा दिए डबल डबल टैक्स देना पड़ रहे हैं ये जैसे नोट मंडी और जीएसटी लगी है ऐसे जो है कारोबार बहुत चौपट हो गया आज शाम को साथ आज साढ़े साढ़े बज रहा है कस्टमर को कोई पता नहीं है जीएसटी इज अ गुड थिंग बट अल्टीमेटली इफ योर मनी इज नॉट रिफंडेड लाइक वी आर ऑल वेटिंग फॉर आवर मनी टू बी रिफंडेड 6 मंथ्स हैव गॉन डाउन ऑलमोस्ट 5 मंथ्स हैव गॉन डाउन नाउ and we, we are not seeing any refund coming to us. It's eating our working capital. If somebody needs blood, and if you don't give it on time, then by the time you bring it, and if he's dead, then it's of no use to him. So it is just like that. All the units, manufacturing units, they are facing a lot of hardship just because that our money is not being refunded on time. The loss in income for the tannery owners has also trickled down to employees, many of whom have lost their jobs and are finding it impossible to make ends meet. पगार क्या मिलता है जो मिलता था उसका हाफ मिलता है जितना काम करने को उतना मिलेगा आठ रुपये का अंडा बिक रहा है साठ रुपये के प्याज मिल मिल रहा है घर का किराया देना है बच्चों को पढ़ाई लिखाई का पैसा देना है आएगा कहाँ से किसी तरह से आदमी जीवन जी रहा है समझिए अगर ये मेक इन इंडिया में ये आया है चमड़े का काम तो हम लोग का जो भी उसके बेनिफिट्स हैं हम लोग तक पहुँचने चाहिए हम लोग तक नहीं पहुँच रहे हैं मतलब कोई भी छूट या सपोर्ट हम लोग को नहीं जो भी है आप अपने से यू आर मतलब नाउ यू आर सेल्फ डिपेंड आपको किसी का सहारा नहीं हम लोग अपने बच्चों को ये काम नहीं करवाएंगे क्योंकि इस काम का कोई फ्यूचर नज़र नहीं आ रहा है Okay, with that, it's a wrap on this edition of Countdown. It is goodbye from Pradeep and my side. Thanks a lot for watching the show. But don't go anywhere. Coming up next is What Did You Miss?